Hello there and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant. Hope you had a chance to join us for our Q&A session with Anjanette Levy and Terry Austin and some other guests. Always a great time. The grueling pressure of those questions, I'm telling you. <clears throat> but but uh, we appreciate you doing that and it's always great to see what folks have on their mind as we watch a case like this one. As you know, we're going to do uh, a deep dive today. They're dark in uh, in uh, Florida here in the case against Jamel Demons. So we're going to take that opportunity as we did with our Q&A to kind of get deeper into the case. This is a double murder trial and uh, even though they are dark on Fridays, a lot happening in that uh, shortened week. We had the holiday Monday and then uh, today's dark. So remember he's facing two counts of first degree murder in the deaths of his friends, Anthony Williams, Kristen Thomas uh, Jr., Christopher Thomas. Uh, and they, you know, they had their, their, uh, their rap names, their stage names, Sack Chaser, Juvie, um, all aspiring rappers. So Jamel, uh, AKA Melly, uh, had his uh, hit Murder on My Mind, his uh, co-defendant Cortland Henry also with him that night, but not at the defense table. He will be tried later. The two victims were in the car as well, and they are saying the defense, and this was a drive-by, and uh, that's how these guys died. However, there is some evidence suggesting that the gunshots took place from inside the vehicle. That's basically the prosecution's case, and that leaves Demons on trial now and Henry to be tried later as the prime targets here. So there were some juror issues this week. This has been just a, a strange case in terms of the parties involved. Prosecution and defense constantly at one another. And now the jury members a little concerned. Uh, yesterday, there was an undercover detective called to the stand to give insight on gang culture. As you know, that's one of the prosecution's kind of sub-issues here, that uh, this was done all as part of a uh, gang initiation or to impress gang members, uh, that Demons was uh, willing to kill these guys who were his friends. Well, this, this uh, gang expert, to protect his identity, was wearing a mask. Yeah, like a literal ski mask, right? That didn't sit right with one of the jurors. They were, that juror was actually brought in to have a conversation with Judge Murphy uh, to talk about this concern. So watch this. Two messages uh, during the last witness's testimony. And uh, the first one said, uh, I don't feel comfortable. Why does he uh, get to see us, but we can't see him? Mm -hmm. That's your message to me? Yes. And the second uh, was, I need a moment. I can't listen properly. When I was a child, I had seen someone uh, get robbed and am having a, an anxiety attack. Yeah. And I guess my concern is, uh, are you able to, to, uh, to sit as a juror or you think this is too much for you? I'm trying to, trying to figure out, and that's why we took a, like a little extended lunch break mm -hmm. uh, to figure out uh, whether you're, you feel comfortable and you're up to it. Yes, I feel comfortable, but I just don't think it was appropriate for someone to be masked up like that. Um, and plus, you guys didn't even tell us. Like, you just, and you don't know what people have been through, so it just, like, it sh shocked me, like, I shocked. So, um, yeah. But I do feel like I can handle it. Um, but that just was inappropriate. I'm sorry? I said I don't believe that was appropriate. Uh, well, some things I, I make certain decisions about uh, things, uh, and uh, then we can go forward with it. And I instruct yours, and are you think you'd be able to follow those instructions, uh, and you pay attention to the evidence, or do you think that you're concerned about the the masking that is going to affect your ability to, to follow the instructions and follow the evidence? Yes, I can listen to all the evidence now that I know he's going to have one mask. And the anxiety issue, we're past that, you're okay? Yeah, it's my vacation. Thank you. So very important, you know, why was this juror so uh, concerned, so upset? And it sounds to me like it was more about almost unfairness. Not that she was frightened uh, by, by this witness that was masked, but that it was just not fair. I'm joined by civil rights attorney Joe Richardson, also with me trial attorney Catherine Lazardo for this hour. Thanks, guys, for joining. Appreciate that. Hey, uh, Catherine, let me start with you. This is, this, you know, we've seen situations in which we've needed to mask the identity of a witness, sometimes a minor, sometimes confidential informants, and put this guy kind of in that category, but we've not really seen them 
physically wearing a mask to the point that the jury doesn't get to see them. You know, it's okay if we don't. We get that. But this witness felt it was necessary. He said he had been threatened, said there was a $50,000 bounty on his head. Um, what, what do you make of this whole situation with the, the masking of the witness? The juror's question here, I think, is very understandable because when viewers saw the um, the witness as well, it was a bit shocking with a ski mask on. Uh, we hear the juror talking to the judge in that clip saying, we were not even told that the witness will testify with that mask on. I think she was initially shocked about it and with her past experience of uh, seeing a masked man with a ski mask uh, robbing a store when she was a child, that brought about anxiety. Maybe if she was prepared beforehand and the jurors were told we will have a witness who will be wearing a ski mask or a mask to cover their identity, that might help her out. Uh, so I could see why she would have felt that. Maybe they could have used Use a different kind of mask because, like you mentioned, sometimes the, the undercover agents or a minor would not be shown, but the jurors can see them, or maybe use a different kind of mask that's less uh, intrusive, such as that black ski mask that we've seen. Yeah, they even could have used, like, put him in another room with a video camera on him that only the jury could see. Um, I, I don't know, it seems to me, I, I mentioned it earlier, I just think it was a bad decision. I think it, it, uh, it affects the process. And let me ask you this, Joe, when we hear this juror say that uh, she just thinks it's inappropriate, she said that more than once, well, to me, that's a bias that she's going to hold against the prosecution. You know, they were the one doing something inappropriate. I, I think there was some argument to, to excuse her from the jury. They had three alternates. What do you think? If I was the prosecution, I would have probably looked looked to do that. Um, the fact of the matter is, I don't disagree with what the juror is saying. Um, it is unfair, and there's two levels. First of all, we spend all of our times and all of our lives looking at people with ski masks on, and we assign criminality to them. Um, you know, that's thing one. Um, and so now here we are, and this guy's basically wearing a mask that makes him look like a criminal. But you know, they get a couple of jury instructions, the judge lets them know. Oh, you know. They're not a criminal. They're not, but but we are a visual society. Seventy to eighty percent of what we get is from visuals, and a huge part of assessing credibility is looking at someone's expressions when they say what they say. And so I think she is on very good ground saying what she's saying on the grounds that she's saying. And now that being said, if I'm the prosecution, again to the point, what I try to do to fix that um, is uh, try to get. Uh, this, um, you know, get that person uh, excused from the jury. The danger with that, though, is in a worst case scenario, this is another reason for a defendant to have an appealable issue or to seek a mistrial. Because if you're getting rid of jurors who basically want to be able to assess credibility the way that all of us assess credibility, the way we all, you know, and, and all the more important in this case, and particularly if, as a defense alleged, they had different options in terms of who to put on. Um, then perhaps that becomes another appealable issue. So there's a lot of problems there, and I don't disagree with this juror at all. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it was a, a bad call, and I think it may come back to haunt uh, the decision in this case if there is a conviction. So that's not the only thing going on in this case this week, even though it was a short week. Earlier, an issue arose when a juror was asking the security guard who was escorting them you know, into court, they kind of shepherd them around. Uh, this juror asked, hey, what's the status of that mistrial? that was filed last Thursday. Now, you know, this is not something a juror should be just uh, discussing or even knowing about, really. Um, and, you know, obviously, they were in the room when the, when the issue was raised, but that, that's it. Um, so there was some confusion about where the juror got the information in the first place. Let's take a listen to this. You know, I need to, to bring to your attention is uh, what we broke this morning. One of our jurors, uh, as uh, Gary was escorting the jurors out, uh, he was approached, uh, and uh, one of the jurors had asked him a question. Gary, go ahead. You want to tell us exactly what was said? And by yes. She, uh, she more or less she said, asked me if she could ask me a question. I said, well, it depends. So the question was, she said, well, what's the status of the mistrial? Mm -hmm. So now, I don't know what you want me to do about that, but that's the question that was posed. Judge, we need to have her name on the record and find out how she would have any knowledge of that because that was never stated in front of them. I think it was. 
think it was a uh, it was done on the record by Mr. Howard the other day. Now, my recollection, and I could be wrong, is different than yours, Mr. Bradley. My recollection is that uh, uh, there was a motion for mistrial that was made out out loud, and, and Mr. Howard came sidebar. Uh, but the jurors been instructed not to read anything about the case. So I don't know if there's something in the newspaper about that that's a different story, but I don't know what you want me to do, if anything. I bring it to your attention. Anything, any real interaction that Gary has with them, something that may seem inappropriate, we always bring it up and let you know. And, and should I assume that for future reference, you'd rather I make those motions outside the presence of the jury? Uh, just come sign. Okay. But um, that was my, re is my recollection. You, you, yes. Is, I thought you, at one point, I don't know which, there was two motions for this trial. I don't know which, at which point, but I believe at at least one point you stood up and said, I have a motion for this trial. No, actually there was a question asked. I said objection, move for mistrial, and no, call the sidebar and ask me to hold it until the end. And then at the end, after the jury left, uh, Mr. Adelstein and I articulated motions for mistrial on an independent basis. And uh, that's how it trend, that's how it went down. But it was announced in open court, correct? Um, I said objection, move for mistrial. You that's my sidebar. recollection. I remember coming to sidebar. And there being that being said in sidebar, I don't recall it being said in open court. I thought it was said in open court. It's a fact that I, I say. So it may sound kind of like a, a difference or distinction without a difference, Joe, but it is important that this juror heard the word mistrial from counsel in open court. It wasn't like they were uh, reading newspapers or checking on some sort of uh, you know, social media. Uh, ex explain you know, the importance that the jury be sanitized from this, this topic. Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, you know, one you, you know, if you're looking at it one way or the other, depending on what side you're sitting on, you're trying to see if the jury or juror did something improper in terms of going outside the four walls of what goes on in the trial, getting further information about the status of the case or anything like that. The fact that the word mistrial was said, so the question was begged, and of course it wasn't answered in court, made that juror ask that question. OK, so you want to make sure that, you know, what is dealt with, uh, you know, has the utmost integrity uh, in the courtroom and that the jurors aren't bringing not only their personal opinions, but information and research from other sources. And so they look to be good on that. The question becomes, now what do you do? Because, you know, the question has been asked. My sense, I mean, we'll see. But my sense is that perhaps the judge said something in general in everyone's presence, uh, something that the, that the attorneys would actually agree to uh, so that there is uh, uh, some sort of clarification, maybe even adding, you know, at times we may start to deal with something or there may be a motion that is brought or there may be something that is said, but uh, it's not actionable as it pertains to your job unless we say so. The word mistrial was said. We acknowledge that. You'll notice all of the discussion took place away from you. That meant that it wasn't in your purview and it wasn't in front of you. So maybe some kind of, and there's, there's probably an instruction to that regard anyway, um, some explanation by the judge that gets them kind of where they need to be. Yeah, something, something curative that would just say, that's, that's not your business. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, we're moving on. And Catherine, what I do like is this is a, a proactive jury. You know, they've had some very interesting things to comment on, and they've made comments when they felt it was necessary. I think this one was handled as it should have been. What, what's your take on the mistrial question? I think so that it was handled that it should have been because uh, like what you mentioned, I like how this jury actually asks questions when they, there's something bothering them because the last thing you want is, a, is a, a panel of jurors who's just sitting there and something's bothering them and you can't uh, actually address that. So the mistrial uh, word used by defense counsel, it just shows the reality of how when you're in trial, the jurors who are late people are relying on their experiences and we hear mistrial in movies or TV shows and that rings a bell to uh, a lot of the jurors or lay people and so 
there's that uh, have to be careful when you're whatever you're saying. But at the same time, he had the right to object and say move for a mistrial, and that's legal. And so the curative way here is for the judge to. Uh, tell the jury when you hear something like that and we don't you're not in preview of that please disregard that uh, kind of like when you hear objection by the defendants uh, or objection by the uh, prosecution counsel that doesn't mean that that's something you have to consider unless I rule for it so there are things happening there and you know we talked about uh, the fact that the defense doesn't really want a mistrial because they're doing all right. Uh, but that's a different issue. Uh, and I do think that uh, the counsel could have handled it differently, could have just said, objection, I, we need a sidebar right now, and then use the word mistrial, you know, a little more quietly. But um, anyway, they dealt with it. And we're going to come back in uh, just a few minutes here and talk more about Melly and the masked man. This is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, detective that felt uh, he had to cover his face and it caused some problems, as we've just learned. We're going to listen to some of that testimony when we come back.